Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I had a conversation here not too long ago with a friend of mine, and uh, it was about the housing market, and he lives in a particularly expensive part of the country, one of those places that uh, housing prices are really just sort of out of control. And as we were talking, what he said was this. He said, you know, the people I feel worst for are the people who are just starting out. They're not going to be able to buy a house for a long time. I mean, what am I handing down to my kids? When they grow up, what's it going to be like for them? And I never really thought about the housing market in that way, to be honest. Um, no, no matter what you think about where it is or where it's going, that's not really the point of the story. See, my response was really didn't have anything to do with the housing market at all. What I thought was, man, I've heard that sentiment before. I've heard it pretty often. Usually it's something like, I don't really like what's going on in the world right now. I feel bad for my kids. What's the world like that I'm handing down to them? Or if you don't have kids, what's the world like that we're, we're handing down to the next generation? Or maybe just simply, what's this world coming to? People say it all the time. And for Christians, it, it, we don't just think about the society around us. We think about how the society around us is affecting the church. And let's be honest, there's good reason to do that. Uh, Gallup poll uh, collected data from 2018 to 2020, and it was published recently, and it indicated that, that um, membership in religious organizations fell below the majority for the first time since 1937, which was when they start, started gathering data. In other, in other words, less than half of the population of the United States was affiliated or members at some sort of religious organization. For Protestant churches, the decline was less than, you know, other groups. But the overall figure remains the same. Some would say that American society is becoming more hostile to the church. I think I might say that it's becoming more and more indifferent. That the church doesn't have the voice that it once did. In other words, that society has just sort of simply stopped listening and has looked for spiritual fulfillment elsewhere. And as Christians, we find ourselves asking those same questions. What's this world coming to? What are, we, what are we handing down to our kids? What's going to happen to my church? It's good that we talk about it today. Today's Reformation Day, as you probably know. And it's good that we're talking about this today because I think Luther certainly must have asked those questions during his lifetime as well. As you might know, he was during his early life tortured by some of the very unbiblical teachings of the church in the 1500s. Works righteousness, uh, salvation that depends on you, being able to measure up to God's standards is how you're saved, that sort of thing. In 1510, he visited Rome and, and saw firsthand the, the corruption that had infiltrated the church and permeated it. I mean, it was all over the place. It was everywhere. False doctrine evil living, corruption, and persecution of anybody who stood in the way. Seven years later, he posted the 95 Theses, and around that same time in his life, he had what people call his tower experience. That, that moment when the gospel hit him kind of like a lightning bolt. Salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And the more that he studied, and the more that he read, and the more that he prayed, the more that he realized a very simple and a very horrifying truth about what was happening around him. And that was that the church had departed from the true gospel. You might remember back in uh, uh, 2017, we celebrated the 500th anniversary of uh, Luther nailing the 95 Theses to the, uh, the church door in Wittenberg, which you know, most people would say was kind of the starting point of the Protestant Reformation. Started, sort of got the wheels in motion that began turning. But this year, 2021, is also a big 500th anniversary. It's the 500th anniversary of uh, the Diet of Worms, or as the Germans say it, the Diet of Worms. And so what it was, what was, was this meeting, this official proceeding that, that Luther was summoned to. And he was before the emperor, and it was before the church, and he was asked to recant everything that he'd written, all the stuff in criticism of the pope and of the doctrine of the church. And even with a promise of safe conduct to and from that meeting, which he had, I mean, he must have realized that if he didn't recant, 
he probably wasn't going to live very long afterwards. Facing such power and such corruption, it must have looked like there really wasn't very much hope. And I'll bet he asked those same questions that we do sometimes. What's the world coming to? What am I handing down to the next generation? And what's going to happen to the church? If you go even further back, when John wrote the book of Revelation, it wasn't a pope that he was standing in front of, of course. It was an emperor. Most people uh, think that he wrote this toward the end of, of the reign of Emperor Domitian from the island of Patmos, a place that he was exiled. Some people, though, think it was earlier under a guy named Nero. And either way, no matter where you put the date of the book, real, tangible, and often even physical persecution of the church was happening all over the place. It was a persecution where people didn't just lose their voice. They lost their very lives. Probably it started under Emperor Nero, that guy I just mentioned, when Paul was living and Paul was writing a lot of his books. But it continued after that for 250 years. We don't know what the death toll was in those, those dark days in the early life of the church. The only source really is a guy named Eusebius. He was a historian a little bit later on. And what he said was countless lives were lost. Myriads is the word that he uses. And it's clear in the book of Revelation that John is really well aware of what's going on. I mean, throughout the book, the church is pictured as enduring immense pressure, immense persecution, just enduring. In John's eyes and in the eyes of the churches uh, around John, in the eyes of the pastors, in the eyes of, of the individual Christians as well, things must have looked pretty bleak. I mean, they were all new converts at that point to Christianity. And newly converted to this faith, it must have seemed like it was on the brink of being stamped out. What was the world coming to? What was going to be left to hand down to the children? And of course, what was going to happen to the church? In many ways, John wrote the book of Revelation in answer to those questions. See, for John, the answer to those questions came on the first Easter. In fact, it was the evening of the first Easter. That morning, remember, John had run to the tomb and he found it empty. No Jesus, right? Only the folded garments that were in the tomb. But that evening, behind locked doors, Jesus appeared. Jesus himself, the resurrected Christ, appears in the locked room. Jesus who won the victory over death. And his appearance solidified that for John and for the disciples. That death itself had been defeated. And if death was defeated, if the ultimate consequence of sin was defeated, then everything else that was smaller was defeated too. And that means persecution, and it means ridicule, and it means arrests, and it means beatings. All that stuff was smaller than death, and all that stuff was defeated in the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Christ is risen, and that means complete victory over all things. But let me read you something else that Jesus said that night. This is from John 20, it's verses 22 to 23, and here's what it, here's what it says. And when Jesus had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness of any, from any, it is withheld. That's the beginning of the church. Receive the Holy Spirit is how Jesus starts this whole thing off. That's what he says. And you know what that means? It's the foundation of the church. It means that the future of the church doesn't depend on how smart we are. The future of the church doesn't matter, uh, how, uh, doesn't depend on how dynamic our personalities are or how charismatic we are when we speak. The future of the church depends on one thing, and that's the God who founded it, and the God who died for it, and the God who will never leave it. See, that's in Revelation 14 why John calls it the eternal gospel. Because it's the gospel that will never leave, and it's the gospel that will never end. It's the gospel that is unfazed by persecution, and unmoved by culture, and unchanged for centuries. And in this vision of the end in Revelation 14, John sees the eternal gospel still there, and still speaking to a broken and a sinful world that desperately needs it. 
throughout the centuries, that gospel has been preserved. When Luther stood there before church and emperor, a day after he was asked to recant, he stood there and, and he was asked again to take back everything he'd ever written about the, the, the pure and the eternal gospel of Jesus Christ. A gospel that wasn't dependent on works for salvation. And so, I mean, in the face of almost certain death, here's what he says. Unless I am convinced by scripture and plain reason, I do not accept the authority of popes and councils, for they have contradicted each other. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not recant anything. For to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Here I stand, I can do no other. God help me. Amen. And not only did he leave without incident, the return to the eternal gospel absolutely set the world on fire. In fact, it eventually ended up pulling the Catholic Church even back closer to the eternal gospel of salvation through Christ alone. That wasn't Luther. I think we can pretty safely say that it was the Holy Spirit the one that Jesus sent to found the church, bringing God's church back to the eternal gospel. You know why we can say that? Because the Reformation was a return to the church focusing on Jesus. And that's the job of the Holy Spirit in the church, to return us back to Christ, to point us back to Christ, to remind us that the death and the resurrection of Jesus overcomes all obstacles. To remind us that the gospel will never, ever end. And it was that that the church was brought back to in the Reformation. Today, the gospel's not going anywhere. That's a simple fact. The gospel's not going anywhere. Here's the blessing for us today of these words in Revelation. It's that we know the end. We know what the end is. Luther didn't know what was going to happen in his lifetime, but God preserved the church. John didn't know what was going to happen in his lifetime, but God preserved the church. And here we sit in our pews this Sunday, or watching online, you know, looking out at a society, and we don't know what's going to happen in our lifetime either. But we know that God preserves the church. And we also know the end. We know that whatever tomorrow brings, or next week, or next year, or 20 years from now, we know the end. We know the eternal gospel is exactly that. It's eternal. It lasts. It never ends. We have a gospel that tells us that Jesus has already overcome death, and that means that whatever else we face in our life, he's overcome that stuff too. We may not know how we get to the end, but we know the end. We know it's coming, and we know what it holds, the complete and the full victory of Jesus. Now, up to this point, everything has probably seemed pretty big picture. And so let me close with something pretty personal. Because we know something else, too. We know that God has given you a part in the story. Not just deliverance from death. Not just deliverance from all the stuff that's smaller than death in this world. Not just salvation. But he's given you a part in the story in that he's made you an agent of of the eternal gospel. Society around us may very well be more indifferent to the teachings of the church, but human need does not stop. Church membership may have dipped to a new all-time low, but human suffering has not gone away. See, the world's need for the gospel, that's never going to end either. And you've got a part to play in the story. Those outside the church may very well have stopped listening to pulpits. But they'll still listen to people. And that's where you come in. See, when they're in need, they're going to come to people like you. People that they trust to help them carry the load. And when they do, you've got the one thing that they really actually need. The eternal gospel that gives life and hope and peace one person at a time, one broken sinner at a time. So what's this world coming to? It's coming toward the final resurrection and the full victory of Jesus. What are we handing down to our kids? We're handing down the same thing we always do. A broken world full of sinful people 
And we're also handing down the eternal gospel. That's our only hope. What's going to happen to my church? I don't know about individual congregations. But I'll tell you this. The church isn't going anywhere. Because the gospel of the church and the God of the church aren't going anywhere either. Amen. And now may the peace of God that passes all understanding guard our hearts and our minds, keeping them steadfast in Christ Jesus. Amen.